Hi, this is Mark from LongIslandWatch.com, and today something a little bit different. Uh, usually, you see my hands in front of the camera. Today, it's going to be a little bit of my face, some hands later. This is going to be uh, episode number six of Watch and Learn. It's going to be part two of a series we did uh, that we did last week on water resistance. I'm going to do a lot of information uh, from Wikipedia. You can look it up yourself. I printed out the article on water-resistant mark. It's got some great information from it. I wanted to go through it with you and I wanted to add my own little addendums here and there. So I had one guy comment uh, that after seeing the video he said, okay, so my 30 meter water resistant watch, I now know what that means. I can go down 30 meters and not worry about it. And I was like, whoa, hold the boat, don't do that. Uh, so in this, in this article they have a great little table and again it's from Wikipedia. There's never really been any guiding spec for water resistance. Over the years, manufacturers maybe tested to a certain depth, but nobody really said what it meant. Or, you know, Seiko would say it's good for showering, and Citizen would say it's good for fishing, but, you know, don't shower with it. So about 2010 or so, uh, ISO 22810 came out, and more or less a lot of, the, you know, they, they kind of got a lot of the manufacturers together, and they more or less agreed, if you will, on some loose terminology for what the different water resistances are going to mean. Uh, so it starts at three atmospheres, which is really the base, basic water resistance. There's nothing generally less than that. That's 30 meters. And they describe that as suitable for everyday use, splash and rain resistant. No showering, no bathing, no swimming, snorkeling, any water related activity. Okay, definitely not for diving. So this is your dress watch. This is a watch that you wear out on the town. Uh, you're not doing any sports in it whatsoever. Again, these are these are guidelines, not you know hard and fast rules. A lot of these little Seiko fives don't have much water resistance, yet people do all these activities in them. But these are just you know overview guidelines. The next step up is going to be five atmospheres or 50 meters. Now we get into some light swimming. They say white water rafting, which I think is kind of weird, um, but non snorkeling. You know you're near the surface. You're still definitely not diving. You're in the pool on the weekend with the kids. Uh, maybe you're going to the ocean and, and hanging around having fun. Next one up is going to be 10 atmospheres or 100 meters. Now you're getting into heavier water activities. Definitely you're swimming, you're snorkeling. Uh, you're not going to go down to 100 meters, and I'll get into that in a second. You're not diving with a tank. Next one after that is going to be, remember I showed you an Orient. I don't have it with me. Uh, but the Orient had a 200 meter mark on it. It was a non-diver's mark. That's, they say, professional marine activity. Serious surface water sports and skin diving. You probably would not want to dive with a tank, and I'll get into that in a minute, but this is a watch that you can wear in the ocean, no problem. You can go snorkeling with it. You can go down, check out the fish, check out shipwrecks, whatever you want to do. But these are not divers' watches per se yet uh, by a different standard, ISO 6425, which I will discuss in a minute. So these ratings that I read to you, uh, so 30 meters, 50 meters, 100 meters, 200 meters, all this means is the manufacturer has tested a sample of the watch, not every watch, has tested a sample, they brought it down to that pressure in a simulated pressure tank, applied that pressure, waited a predetermined amount of time, and then took it out and checked for water intrusion and there was none. So why is that bad? Well, it doesn't really tell us that the watch can go down to that depth and survive down there. Because there's a number of things going on, a number of different elements that come into play. Number one, they test a new watch off the factory floor, right? So this isn't a watch that's been sitting in, you know, on your desk or in your, in your dresser for two or three years. It's got new seals and it's been put together by factory specifications. It was never open for a gasket change. It was never open for a battery change. It hasn't been exposed to water other than it's test water. Seawater is very corrosive. It hasn't seen any other corrosive elements. Uh, they don't manipulate the watch underwater per se. They don't flip it around, turn it, expose different sides to, to uh, to the current. They don't change the water temperature. Like when you're diving, the water temperature changes. Those changes in temperature cause the case to expand and contract, uh, and water intrusion could come about by a result of that stuff. I wanted to talk about the ISO 2281, and, and so th this mark that you get, uh, we call it a mark because ISO says, you know, these are the standards you should meet, and after that you can put down, you know, 50 meter, you know, water resist on your watch. You can't call it a diver's watch, that's a different spec. So they put, they put forth these specifications, and you can read them online just like I am. Uh, you can even buy the spec if you want, and you can see what tests they have to make. 
But I will just, I'm just going to briefly go off the, the bullet points again. I'm just reading, I'm not reinventing anything. So these are the things that ISO 2281 tells you you have to do to get a water resistant mark on your watch. Resistance when submerged in a depth of 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters is roughly, what, four inches? Four inches of water for an hour. You have to put it in that four inches and you have to push on the crowns or buttons. So perpendicular to the case. So you push on the, the buttons with a one pound force and on the crown while it's underwater. So, you know, any of the seals that are on the crown, any of the seals that are on the buttons are gonna get tested by this. So resistance to different temperatures. They're gonna take it and they're gonna put it in four inches of water again, go from 40 degrees centigrade, sit it there, let it sit there for a few minutes, you know, get it come, let it come up to temperature. 40 degrees centigrade is uh, about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, then they're gonna put it in 20 degrees centigrade water, let it sit there, and then back to 40. And now what you're doing is you're starting to exercise parts, you're starting to get the metals and all the parts to expand and contract. So if a leak could, should occur or would occur, um, this would help uh, bring it on. Overpressure. So now we are putting it up to the rated pressure. It says 100 meters. We simulate it to 100 meters. Uh, and we leave it there for 10 minutes. It's not really a long time. If you're going to dive, you're probably diving longer than 10 minutes, but still. Uh, this air overpressure, which is a silly spec. No magnetic or shock resistance, no negative pressure, meaning outgassing, uh, no strap attachment. We don't care how hard you pull on the strap and uh, no corrosion. There is a condensation test, which I thought was interesting, even for, you know, this, I don't want to say low level water resistance because it's not a diver's mark, but just regular standard mark that is probably on almost 80% of the world's watches. That's my guess. Uh, so you heat the watch up to around 40 degrees centigrade on a hot plate. You leave it there until it comes up to full temperature. You know, you can't, the thermal lag is out. We wait until it really comes up to that temperature, 40 to 45 degrees uh, centigrade. Then we take a drop of water. Remember, I did ice on the, uh, the condensation test I did the other day. We take a drop of water at about room temperature, 20 degrees centigrade, drop it in the middle, leave it there for a minute, and then you wipe the glass and you look for evidence of condensation on the crystal fogging. And if there is any moisture inside the watch or you know too much moisture, this will bring it out. As I showed you, I can get fog to appear on water resistant watches, uh, you know, diving 200 meter watches. But this is a much, you know, much lighter case of condensation. Uh, but if there is water intrusion in the case, this will bring it out. And the condensation test is done after all the other tests that I had mentioned to see if any uh, water has come into the case. So I had said before, this spec for this normal water resistant mark, this is not done on all watches. It's done on a sampling basis. I, if they made a thousand watches, maybe they test, I don't know, 20. It's, again, this is my guess. I have no idea. Uh, the reasoning behind that is if the factory, you know, follows other ISOs, like ISO, the ISO 9000 um, series of specs, and you m make your parts all consistently, you have consistent assembly procedures, then all watches made uh, in your factory should be able to pass the same exact test. Uh, obviously, there are always watches that, or always items made in any factory that aren't made up to snuff as the rest of them. Uh, but so that is, you know you could have one that doesn't meet these requirements because they are not testing every single one. If you have a watch from, or if you had a watch in the 70s or 80s, and remember I had at least one, uh, one piece that carried the mark of waterproof. Waterproof was abolished in 1990, uh, at least legally, because you can never really say that something is waterproof. Waterproof would mean no water ever gets into it. I guess that would be hermetic. Uh, not happening. Uh, over time, any watch will leak, even the best. And when I say over time, I mean the long time. It could be 100 years, 500 years. But waterproof is just a misleading term. And in a litigious society such as ours, uh, they cannot use the terminology anymore. The, the ISO spec, the 2281 spec, kind of abolished that. Nothing is truly waterproof. Water will always get in. Okay, and that's going to bring us now to the big boy, the diver spec, ISO 6425. Woo. Okay, so I've got a, a Seiko, an NSKX 007. I don't know, if, maybe this was, how the hell? <laughs> maybe this was in the other video. Uh, I'm not sure if it was this exact watch. Uh, but this is a, another junk piece from my shelf. Uh, this is a diver's watch, and it carries, if you can see just under the hour hand, it says diver's 200 meter. Uh, if it can't, I think it's got it. It says diver's 200 meter, and also on the case back, scuba divers is written. That diver's mark, that's almost like a trademark. Um, it's not really an official trademark, at least I don't think it is. 
uh, but it means you've met ISO 6425. A lot of uh, the dive watches that we sell are certified to ISO 6425, the Seikos, your 007s, your Monsters, uh, you know, all, obviously all your Prospects divers. Orient M Force divers are all ISO 6425 rated. So what is ISO 6425? Well, it's a more stringent spec than uh, the one I went through just a minute ago uh, with all the uh, pressures and the condensation and all other stuff. So first we're just going to go through ratings. There's not much to say as far as ratings. Divers ratings you, w used to have 100 on them, um, sometimes 150. Nowadays, they're really every single one is 200 and then there's 300s for uh, mixed gas diving. I won't discuss that. Um, that actually has its own subset of specifications for mixed gas. Uh, almost every diver that we deal with though is 200 meters. Uh, so 200 meter diver, suitable for scuba at depths, not suitable for saturation diving, obviously. Uh, and this is a typical rating for a diving watch. Now, the ISO spec goes further than just water resistance. They do other stuff uh, like um, strap attachment that we'll talk about. The bezel is specified, how the bezel operates, um, luminosity. This is all specified. Okay, so the first thing and the most important thing, and this, will, this answers a lot of questions on pricing. ISO 6425 requires every single watch that carries the diver's mark be tested. So if you're Seiko and you're putting out SKX 007s, every single one you're putting out has to, has to pass these specs that I'm going to talk about. Whereas before it was just a random sampling, statistical sampling, now every single one's got to meet it. So you know that when you buy your 007 and you strap it on for the first time, put a tank on your back and go under the water, the watch has already been tested. You don't have to worry about anything. At least that's the theory. I'm not in Seiko, I can't say that they do test every single one, but I'm sure they do. Uh, much like a chronometer, every chronometer is tested uh, for chronometer specs, every diver's got to be tested. So I'm going to go kind of in order of what I did before, and like I said, I'm going to read off the spec a little bit, uh, again, because it's all available out there for you. Uh, so underwater now, remember before we went underwater, you know, about four inches for a little while, now we're going under by a foot, 30 centimeters, for 50 hours. This is over two days. Now, yeah, a foot of water is not a lot of water, but 50 hours is a long time um, for, you know, if there's a small leak or uh, any other inconsistency. 50 hours, you know, should bring it out. The same condensation test is specified. You do it before and after uh, all the tests to make sure that no water has come into the watch. The watch is tested. This is a big one. A 25% over its rated value. So a 200 meter water resistant watch is tested to 250 meters. A little factor of safety there. Uh, engineers love factor of safety. If your life depended on your watch, I'm sure you would appreciate a factor of safety as well. Uh, so they put it in the pressure tank, they pressurize it within a minute, and it stays there for two whole hours. Now it stays there statically, so if it's, it's just sitting there, uh, but it's there for two whole hours. Then the pressure is reduced within a minute, almost like an explosive decompression and held there for an hour. Now you're pressurizing, unpressurizing, you're really giving water a lot of opportunity and a lot, uh, you know, a lot of chance to get into the watch. You're really testing those seals. You know, when you pressurize the watch, everything's flexing. A tremendous amount of force on every surface. It's compressing the watch. And then all of a sudden you say, okay, pressure, you're gone. And every surface now springs back to you know, almost atmospheric conditions. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of chance for if there's any cracks, crevices, uh, for things to come through. We got thermal shock again. We're going to go from the now, but now we're going to go from 40 degrees centigrade all the way down to 5 degrees centigrade, back up to 40. So you go really fast, like this thermal shock bath. Uh, and again, that's the same thing. You're going to go from you know hot where the metal is you know expanding. It's certainly happening on a measurable level if you had the right tools. Uh, and then you're shrinking it all back down to. 5 degrees centigrade, that's near freezing or close to the inversion point of water, and then back up to 40. So again, we're giving water a really good opportunity to come on in. And then there's more. Because it's a diving watch, we're not only worried about water resistance. It's got to have certain functionality to it. And one functionality is that rotating one-way bezel. See, it only goes counterclockwise. If you'll notice, the bezel has a luminous pip in it. Whoops, right there. The watch obviously has loom on it. You've all seen glow shots of Seiko's. Uh, the bezel is graduated every five minutes. There is a dot and also the seconds hand has loom on it. Why is that all important? Oh, and I want to say 
the hour and minute hand are distinctly different. Besides different lengths, they are different shapes. A lot of times you'll see a, a diving watch like a Squale's got the orange minute hand. What's up with that? Well, there's a reason for it. This is all, it's all great stuff because it all makes a hell of a lot of sense. So a diving watch to meet 6425 has to have a time pre-selecting device. It's basically a diving bezel, a timing bezel, okay? And it's gotta be marked every five minutes and it's gotta be, have a clear pip so that you can see it in the dark. It cannot be subject to inadvertent rotation. So you can only turn it counterclockwise, you can't turn it clockwise. Uh, so all watches do it differently. Um, well, I mean, I guess unidirectional is the most popular. Omega Pull Prof number from the 70s used, I think it was the 70s, used that red push button. Squally uses push to turn. Squally Tiger uses a red push button. Some companies just have a, it's a really tough detent to push it through. Uh, but that, you know, what that basically does, if you're a diver, is if it only goes counterclockwise, all you can do is shorten your dive. You cannot lengthen it. And maybe using a diving bezel is, is another watch and learn. So these are, these are um, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier. These are all additional criteria for mechanical dive watches. Quartz dive watches are different. Uh, quartz dive watches are really falling out of favor just because nothing worse than a battery dying on you when you're diving because that would be pretty bad if you didn't know it. So now we have come into nighttime requirements or luminosity in the dark. Really it's meant because you're underwater and there may not be a lot of light, but in the dark you need to be able to see the time, set the bezel, indication that the watch is running. So in this case, in the dark, you would see the second hand moving. So that would say, that would be your clue that, hey, the watch is running. I thought this was interesting, I didn't know this. Magnetic resistance, you know, people talk about anti-magnetic. You know, obviously mechanical wristwatches have a lot of small little metal parts inside and a magnetic field will really mess up their timekeeping ability. Three exposures to a magnetic field of 4,800 amps per meter. I have no idea if that's a big magnetic field. I guess I could look it up, but I just thought it was interesting that it's here and the watch must keep its accuracy to plus or minus 30 seconds a day as measured despite that field. Shock resistance, we're going to hit it with a, a shock impulse, boom, boom. Uh, resistance to salty water, obviously it's going to be a diving watch, so it's got to be able to go into salty water and it can't, it can't corrode, degrade. That's why they're all made out of, of 316L stainless steel. Interesting what, how a brass or a bronze watch would fare in that because obviously it's going to corrode on purpose. Um, so maybe that can't wear the diver's mark, I don't know. One of the coolest things, and this is the last one, resistance of the strap to a 45 pound load. So imagine this had a strap on it. I would hook it up to a 45 pound mass and I would hang it by the strap. And the strap, nor the strap attachment, the spring bars that are here, the extra thick Seiko spring bars, maybe that explains why Seiko spring bars are so thick, uh, cannot snap. So maybe you're diving and your watch gets snagged on a a rock, a piece of coral, a shark tries to bite it off your wrist, I don't know. So it will stay and it will not come off. And that's important for a dive watch also. So, you know, the dive watch spec is not just water resistance. It's more than that. It's, you know, the strap can't get caught. It's magnetic field. It's all these things that above and beyond important than a regular conventional, you know, going to go jump in the pool watch. And lastly, if it meets all the specs, you can write divers, you know, you can see it right there, the last bullet. It divers 200 meter or whatever, whoops, somewhere over here. Um, and that is the nomenclature that you're allowed to put on the watch. I want to do one more thing and that's going to be um, on the tabletop. It's been a misnomer and I discussed it in the last Watch and Learn that when you move your wrist through the water, swimming around, there's dynamic water pressure that's impinging on the seal and that is a cause for uh, you know, concern. So if the watch is, say, 50 meters water resistant and you're at 20 meters and you're running, you know, going through the water, you're swimming like a madman, that there's an extra pressure that will be more than the watch is rated for. I believed it for a very long time. It is all over the internet. People talk about it all the time. I probably told customers about it. Um, I'm wrong. Uh, I did the math. I want to do the math with you and you can do the math yourself and you can see that it's poppycock. So one second. So if you did not come here for a pressure lesson, uh, maybe fast forward to the very end. What I've done here is I've extracted two elements of Bernoulli's pressure equation. This is something that we learn in engineering school. Every engineer learns it. There's three aspects to uh, Bernoulli's equation. I have two of them here. The third one doesn't really apply. Uh, the first one is uh, hydrostatic pressure, you know, the static pressure depth. The second one is that I'm going to you know, show doesn't matter is the dynamic pressure. Uh, that's from stuff moving around in a current. You know, you, you're driving in a car, you lower the window and you stick your hand out and your hand gets ripped back. Uh, you know, you hold it out flat. That is dynamic pressure. The, the air is putting pressure on your hand. 
same way, a watch underwater. You know, water is a, air is a fluid, water is a fluid. Uh, obviously just much different densities. So it's doing the same thing, it's doing it to seals the watch. So first I want to just derive really quick, and I'm sorry for this if, if, if it bores you. Uh, so the hydrostatic pressure is equal to the density of water, rho, times the gravitational constant, times the depth of water. You can look these things up if you need to. A thousand kilograms per meter cube is the density of water. 9.8 meters per second squared is the acceleration of gravity. And a hundred meters depth gives us about 980,000 pascals. So, you know, like uh, we've been talking about water resistance, 10 atmospheres is a hundred meters uh, of water depth. Uh, a pascal is really just a, a, it's a metric term for uh, pressure. So atmospheres, PSI, depth of water, inches of mercury, your barometer measures, millimeters of mercury, uh, all the same numbers, uh, all the same meaning, just different units. So this is 980,000 pascals. So now back to the, now back to dynamics. So the dynamic portion is one half density again times the velocity squared. A thousand kilograms per meter cube still. And I assumed a wrist moving through the uh, water with three meters per second uh, velocity. So what is that? It's about 10 feet per second. And that seems pretty quick for a swimmer, you know, if you're moving your arm around. But you'll, you'll see uh, you could really increase this number and nothing really happens. That's about 450 pascals. So remember, this was, a th this was 100 meters, this number. This is what 3 meters per second adds to it. 450 pascals. It's 3 orders of magnitude off. It's roughly 2 inches of water. It's nothing compared to 100 meters. 2 inches. Nothing. So I said, okay, well, let's say I wanted to approximate about 25 meters of water depth. You know, let's say I'm at 25 meters and my watch is rated to 50. How fast would I have to go? Oh, well, you could do it yourself. I'd have to go 50 miles per hour. So as you can see, you know, dynamic pressure, I believe, is a farce and it does not have to be considered. So I hope you liked that little uh, engineering lesson, science lesson. Uh, like I said, you know, I'm an engineer. Science is great. There's a lot of stuff you can learn. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video on water-resistant marks. Maybe you'll read up on it and next time you buy a watch or someone says to you, you know, oh, you know, 30 meters, I'm going to go dive in with it. You can maybe educate them a little bit and tell them, well, why they probably shouldn't. So this has been Mark from LongIslandWatch.com. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have not subscribed to our channel, please do so at this time. If you have any questions or comments, you want to start up a conversation, please put it down below and I'll be sure to address it. And uh, this has been Watch and Learn number six. And yes, I will continue to do them. Yeah, you're all loving them. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all the great ideas you're all putting there. Thank you.